friends, and welcome, or welcome back. This is the Legacy Bible Podcast, a place where you will hear messages from the Word of God, taught by our pastor, the Reverend Chuck Rains of the Fellowship Bible Church in Joliet, Illinois. Today, we're going to be having uh, more from the tape archives. Let's see. Uh, this one is, let me look at my list here. Ah, it says, without further notice, the imminent return of Christ. Very good message. And it was originally recorded back in January 26th of 1992. So it was recorded back then, but it's still a good message for today because, well, because the Bible has no expiration date on it. It's good no matter what year. That's why you can listen to it today, next week, next month, whenever you want. And it'll still be good. So let's get right to it. I mean, I'm kind of anxious to hear it. So take it away, Pastor Rains. I want you to turn to 1 John 3. Again, the theme is that the Lord Jesus is coming back. Sure, after that awful age ahead of the trials on this earth, called the tribulation, he'll set up his kingdom. But there is a hope for the believer in this age that he will come for them personally. The Lord Jesus is going to come for us without further notice. That's the phrase you often hear, without further notice. I thought of a couple of examples. Now to the saved, what does it mean without further notice? Now let's say you get a phone call, or maybe we better have the fellow actually show up at your door, because phone calls sometimes you just have a hard time believing. And somebody comes to your door and they say, you have just won an all-expense trip to Hawaii. One condition. You must be ready to go without further notice. Any time within the next five years that our limousine shows up at your door. Now, they always have these things, added bonus. Do you ever get in there, you see these things? Added bonus, if you act right away. Well, added bonus. If you accept the offer, all of your family who would be ready to go within one minute of our limousine showing up at your door may go also. Right? One minute of our limousine showing up at your door in the next five years, they may go also. Quite an offer. All expense trip to Hawaii, all paid. Just one thing. You've got to be ready to go. What would you look like? You start worrying about that. First few days, you might make sure your hair is combed and curled and your clothes are fresh and clean. But could you keep it up for five years? Hmm? Every time you took a bath, would you start wondering? Hmm. Every time you started digging in the garden, would you start wondering, what if it came right now? How about when you're really doing a dirty job? Some of the men under the car, all greasy, filthy. Hmm? What if it came now? I'd have to go off to Hawaii looking like this. <laughs> Without further notice. Well, the Lord Jesus is going to return for the believers without further notice. And you're going to go doing whatever you're doing and looking whatever you look like. But thank the Lord you won't get to heaven that way. Because in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you will be changed. Your body will be changed. The corruptible will put on incorruption. The soiled clothes and the smudged face will be left behind. And you'll have a glorious body like that of the Lord Jesus. That's exactly what you're told. You'll be taken away. 
caught away in the twinkling of an eye. It'll all be done. The dead that are already dead but have believed in Christ, their bodies, though left in this earth, though their spirits are with him, their bodies have been left here, they will be raised. Somebody asked me last week, why does God tell us that about the body? Why, why is it important even that the human body be raised? After all, there are some Christians that have been dead for 2,000 years. And the state of their body, as far as this world is concerned, well, not very good <laughs> after 2,000 years of being in the grave. Your body isn't much. <laughs> Why is it important to raise up whatever there is left of that body? Well, the answer is that when the Lord Jesus saves us, he saves all of what we are. His salvation comes to our spirits, our minds, and our bodies. Remember, we're created things. God just didn't create spirits and set them to roam in the earth. He didn't just create minds and spirits to roam in the earth. He created man as a living soul, but also gave him a body. That's part of what man is. Uh, Adam and Eve had bodies, and it was the vessel through which the Lord Jesus, uh, well, I better say he was the creator, but it's through which the Lord Jesus made provision for man to have procreation, you know, in other words, to have babies and to bring on further races. Uh, we can, with our bodies, touch this physical world. Our spirits and our minds are housed in our bodies. It's the house for us. Sometimes it's called our house. It's our tent. It's our dwelling place. It localizes us. We're not infinite. We're finite. We're localized. We're part of a three-dimensional creation. And something terrible happened to that body when sin entered. The body began to die, and eventually it did die. Death began to work in the body. Spiritual death happened immediately when Adam sinned. Physical death began to work. It was already, it already had that body in its grasp. And by the time Adam was 965 years old from God's counting, and we don't know at what point that counting began, Adam died. Adam died. Eve died. And everybody except those that are alive on the earth today, since that time, has died. This present generation is all that has lived of the human race. The rest of them are all dead. For thousands and thousands of years, they've been dying. The salvation that the Lord Jesus brings is not just for your spirit. It's for your mind. You're going to know even as you are known. It's for your body. The body that came under the curse of sin has been delivered from it in, in the Lord Jesus' redemption, in his salvation. And to prove that the redemption even touches your body, he has to raise the body. He's got to give you a body that has victory over death. That means a glorified body. He's displayed that for us in his own body that was given to him in his resurrection. And you will have one like him. In fact, John picks that up here in 1 John 3 and says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it doth not yet appear, or it has, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. There it is. When he is revealed, we shall be like him. Where? Well, I want to tell you something, that you are already like him in righteousness. 
you are already clothed with his righteousness if you have received him as your Savior. But this is future. We shall be like him. My old nature is still with me. But when he changes me, I will be like him, and my old nature will not be there. My mind is still limited, but when I'm made to be like him, I'll know even as I'm known. My body is limited to this earth. Sickness can attack it, and death claims it. But when I see him, when he is revealed, I'll be like him. I'll have a body like his. Changed. And that's that great chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, you know, that explains about our bodies, that this body, this corruptible, is going to have to put on incorruption. This, this mortal shall put on immortality. You're going to be changed. Your body will be different. And the whole of the person is going to be put back together. The body of those that are dead can go ahead and oxidize in this earth, whether slowly in the grave or quickly by cremation or other means. It's still oxidation. It's still in this earth. You can't, you can't, you know the laws of thermodynamics. You can't get the stuff out of this earth. If it's here, it's going to stay here. It might stay here in the form of energy or light or mass or something. Or Some of those dear saints might be crawling around part of the body of a six-legged creature right now. It, it, that's fine. God knows where they are. He's going to just take all the parts and change them in a twinkling of an eye and recreate it to be fashioned after the body of Christ. Wonderful hope. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Well, there's also something for the... oh. I think I'm going to attach that to the verse that Mark quoted. I thought that would be a perfect verse because I used it last week. It's Hebrews 10, 37. I think this is the verse that probably would be good for us to keep in mind for the believer. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. I'll say it again. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. That's our hope. Hebrews 10, 37. Now to the unsaved. Oh, let me read something before I give you my illustration about them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> I'd like to read it, verse 9. I'm jumping right into this story about the uh, period of time called the tribulation in the Scripture. Actually, it's into the last three and a half years, even. The last three and a half would be called the Great Tribulation. And it describes the one called the beast, the Antichrist. Here, in this verse, he's called the lawless one. This is Second Thessalonians 1. Uh, verse 9. I said 1, but it's chapter 2, verse 9. First Thessalonians. Second Thess I'll say it again. Let me get it straight. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, because they just wouldn't receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, for that reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Now, the lie, of course, is right from Satan. It is the, the lie of, that he gave to Adam and Eve when he said, uh, surely God has not said the lie. 
the contradiction of truth, the contradiction of God, the contradiction of righteousness, the great lie that the righteousness of Christ is not needed, that you're all right in yourself, that Satan speaks truth. Not at all. It's a lie. And those who would not receive the love of the truth but believe the lie, now God is going to send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. And then it says this, that they all, verse 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, in this age, we can go to men and women and to boys and girls and say, God loves you and has sent his son to die for you. He has died in your place. The Son of God wants you for himself. You must believe the truth, the love of the truth. Receive it. Turn from your sin. Ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you and give you eternal life. We can offer that to men and women and boys and girls everywhere. I, by the way, just a little adjunct to that statement. I've been meditating on a, on a verse in the Scripture. I'm not going to tell you the reference just yet, but I want to tell you this first. I've been meditating on this verse, and I've been thinking how it tells us about God's nature, His righteousness, His love, and it tells us about His will. And I thought, now, that would be a great verse to show that the love of God is really, is truly universal, and that His love is what caused Him to do certain things, not the will causing the love to be expressed, but the, the love was what was expressed in His will. Well, I'll tell you the reference. It's John 3.16. I've just been meditating on it. I thought in the future I'd like to speak on those things. But back to this. That that uh, here, the day is going to come in its terrible time, tribulation, when the beast has come and, and he's deceived people and he's claimed to be God, as it says in the verses above those that I read. <clears throat> in fact, this is the last uh, three and a half years of the tribulation when this all happens. Uh, he actually is seated on the throne in Jerusalem saying that he is God. He is God. And people that receive his mark in their foreheads or in their hands so that they can buy and sell food, you know, they can't even eat. They can't even buy food to eat in those days if they don't submit to worshiping the beast. I can truly say that it would be better to starve to death than to take the mark and get some bread. It would be better to starve to death. Because, you see, Dying in this body isn't to be compared to eternal death. I mean, you might starve to death trusting in the Lord Jesus. But trusting in the beast, trusting in Satan, just so you can live a few days longer and then pay the price of eternity in hell, is just unthinkable. But there will be multitudes. Listen, it will be multitudes of people who make that choice and choose the bread. Now, when they do, God sends them strong delusion. God will send them a strong delusion, and they will believe the lie, and they're going to be sealed up in their condemnation. Once they have submitted to that mark, once they have taken the mark, they cannot reverse it. It's done. I call them walking dead men. I mean, they're still walking around in their bodies, but they're just as good as dead. And, and when they die, they're, they're destined for an eternity in hell. It's an awful, awful thing to think about that deception, but it's coming. Well, I have an example for that. By the way, there's a... Well, let me give you this. I told you about the trip to Hawaii for the saved, right? Well, for them, let's say this. Let's say there was a great sale. And the great sale... Uh, came at a time of the year when it was about 95 in Chicago and very humid, and 105 over in Hawaii. And the great sale was on tickets to Hawaii. $79 one way, 
ticket to Hawaii for anybody that would take it. And let's say that a few people went down and got the tickets, and sure enough, they were available. Went to the airline, got the tickets. And the tickets, um, there was no gimmick. It was a true offer. But not many showed up for them. But it did say this in the ad. Offer may be withdrawn without further notice. The hot days of summer kind of went into fall, and it was an unusually, say, hot fall that year. And and then a great frigid air mass came out of the north unseasonably early and came down on the United States. And just as the news of this tremendous frigid air mass got onto the airwaves, people decided, now tomorrow I'm going to go down and I'm going to get that ticket to Hawaii. And it was a great rush to the ticket office the next day, but guess what? The offer had been withdrawn without notice. Time was up. Opportunity was gone. When you receive Christ, you have an all-expense trip to heaven planned for you. All expenses paid at the cross by the blood of Christ. You're going to dwell in a place that far outshines any hotel in any spa. And you'll have clothing to wear that knows no parallel in this earth. The stereo systems down here can't begin to compete with the music of heaven. And your companions, they'll be wonderful. All the saints of all the ages, the angels of heaven, and God himself. But thank you, Lord, it won't be for two weeks. It won't be a vacation. It'll be forever. And for the ungodly, they pass by the wonderful offer that the Lord Jesus has made to them, and if they do, they do to their hurt. And without notice, that offer is going to be withdrawn. The day will come when they will want to escape judgment, but it will be too late. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. No one cast into the lake of fire will want to go there. No one. In 1 John 3, there's going to be a great change. It will come in the moment of the twinkling of an eye for us, we're told in verse 2. But here... In verse 1, there's already a great change that's happened. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. The change is this. We used to be known, if you want to read Ephesians 2, as children of the devil. But in 1 John 3, a change has happened. Those that were the children of the devil are now the children of God. That's a change. That change has given us hope. Where did it come from? The source. Let's identify it. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. The source is the Father. God the Father. What's the cause? What caused God to give us this wonderful change to make us children of God? What caused it? Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Love was the cause. The love in God the Father caused him to give us the change. What's the result? Well, when we look toward God, we see in verse 1, we're called his children. Used to be the children of the devil. But so with regard to God, we're the change is this. This is the result. We're children of God. And then regarding the world, there's also a change. 
Because we read on down here and say um, in verse 2, well, I'm going to go on. Uh, I gotta, I've got to read on down to these verses. Um, Well, let's take it up in one. I don't want to get too late here. Therefore, um, it says, the world does not know us because it did not know him. With regard to the world, with regard to the Father, we're his children. But with regard to the world, they don't know us. That's the result. That's a sum of what comes in the next several verses. They just don't know us. What's the final working of that change? That's in verse 3. The final working of the change that has happened in you is that change in your body. That's the final step. Verse 2 tells us how we're going to be like him, you see. When he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So the final result, if I said so verse 3, I meant verse 2, is that we're going to be like him. And now the practical application of it is in verse 3, that because you're changed and because you're like him, during your life now as a child of God, <coughs> you should show it out. You should, what the scriptures say, purify yourself. By the way, that's an ongoing work, an ongoing process. You know, you are instantly made righteous when you are saved. You are given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But the scripture speaks to those who are God's children and tells them to purify themselves. They're supposed to deal with sin in themselves, in their lives to turn away from it, to reject it, to cast it away. That's what purification is. Purify yourself that way. Turn away from sin. Saints, down here dealing with this world, dealing with this life, are supposed to be busy in that process, purging out sin, letting the Lord show his righteousness in them. Let the world see that you're walking in righteousness. Let them see that you're walking in the love of God. When you read these verses that follow that, you find out what it means to practice righteousness. Now, you could write down for yourself, and I wish you would, that you look this over so you can see how God would want you to understand what, he, what this purification process is all about. From verse 4 through verse 9, you have a wonderful practical section that tells you how to practice righteousness. What does it mean? What does it mean to live in this world in a righteous way? Well, um, he says, you commit sin, you commit lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. You're not supposed to go that way, he says. Practicing righteousness. Go down to verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed, God's seed, remains in him. Him there is the believer. God's seed remains in the believer. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. The context in these verses isn't simply that you, that's impossible for you to do one sin. That's not the context. The context is practice. It's the idea of practicing righteousness. You cannot practice sin if you are born of God. It cannot be the results of your nature. It can't be the, the outcome and your practice moment by moment, day by day, if you're truly born of Him. You can't do it. There will be conflict. You won't love it. Oh, you can sin, but it doesn't flow from your soul. It doesn't flow from what you are. That isn't how godliness acts. It isn't how the Spirit of God would have you act. It isn't how the born-again person behaves. So, another thing he tells you, not only are you practicing righteousness, in verse 10 he says you're loving. You know why you're practicing righteousness? Because God is righteous. You know why you love? Because God is love. Look at verse 10. 
In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. There you are. You got two things. Practice righteousness and love others. Love your brother. Brother would be those here who also know Christ. But uh, as the Lord Jesus, I think, taught in the parable of the Good Samaritan, mm -hmm. who's your neighbor? That the love of God is really sending, is sent out across the earth. It's sent out to all men. There is a love of God that is be, to be displayed through his children to all men. There is a, there is a shared love. There is a communion in love, however, with the brother, with those that also know him. There's something we can share only with them because they don't know him who are, you know, have rejected the Lord Jesus. If they reject the Lord Jesus, they can't, can't have that fellowship in that love. And then we love the brother. And verse 11 says, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. You want to say it again? What does it mean to live out your Christian life the way it's supposed to be? Practice righteousness means turn away from sin. By the conviction of the Spirit of God, by the help from the Word of God, understand what sin is, identify it in your life, reject it, choose righteousness. Be practicing that. That's an ongoing process. Love. Love seeks the good of the other person. Love the brother, love one another. That's the message that God gives. Loving and righteousness. Why? Because he, in his nature, what are the, what are the elements of God's nature? Righteousness and love. That's it. And the responsibility is choice. Why do you do that? Because Jesus is coming back. Because the saint should have his eyes on heaven and the soon return to the Lord Jesus. Because you want to be like him right now in your behavior. Because you shall be like him in every respect when he returns. And if you love him, your heart is drawn to be like him right now. Act like him. Talk like him. Behave like him. Love like him. It's not easy in the sense that it's not without a battle. It's what I mean by not easy. You could always say it's easy when we yield to the Spirit of God because he then supplies all grace, all power we need to live righteously. Take up the issues of the day. Contend with this world. Reject the devil. Rebuke the devil. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Because the Lord Jesus is coming soon. And you ought to be like him. If you love him, be like the one you love. If you really love somebody, you want to be with them, want to be in agreement with them. Be like the one you love. If you love him, draw close to those who love him. Give your heart to those who love him. Talk to him and walk with him. Walk like him, rejecting the sin and pollutions of this world pleasing him in all things. It's a simple message. Powerful, though. I deliver you from the sins of this world. Lord Jesus, in light of your return, we ought to be a people looking to heaven. We have a, we have a hope that any time, without further notice, you show up, take us away. At the same time, Lord, we think of this world and the awfulness of what they're going to be sealed up in when they believe the lie and the condemnation that they'll suffer because they don't receive Christ. We need the power of the Spirit of God to live righteously. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't love in our own strength. Lord, give us your power. By it, might we glorify you day by day. We praise you and love you and wait for your soon appearance, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Raines.
for another message from the Word of God. And if you liked it, come back again next week. Like I always say, we'll have more. We got plenty more here to go through. So no lack of material to run out of the tape archive had hundreds of tapes in it. So I'll keep going as long as you keep coming back and listening. Even if you don't keep coming back and listening, I'll still do it. They'll still be up here. So when you're ready to come back, they'll be here for you to listen to. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to say, uh, I think I mentioned last week about the, the cards. It's still, still in effect. So if you want postcards, be sure to send for those up on the, up on the website. There's information on the, the show notes about that. And if you want uh, prayer requests, we could do that. So there's a lot of things that the people of the Fellowship Bible Church would like to do for you. All you got to do is contact them and they'll be glad to help you out with either the postcards or the prayer requests. So with that being said, I want to say thank you for listening. Because if you weren't out there listening, well, yeah, I would still I would still produce podcasts. Even if you weren't out there listening, I was going to say, if you weren't out there listening, I wouldn't be making these. No, I would be making them. Because this is something that God has called me to do. So I'd still be doing it. But I'm glad that you're out there anyway listening. So be sure to subscribe on your favorite uh, podcast listening platform. and you would like comment that'd be nice you know subscribe comment but most of all the most important thing is to learn that's why i'm putting them out here so you can learn from from these uh messages and use them in your own uh in your own bible study and you can share them with other people so that would be a good thing don't you think yeah okay so i'll see you again next week so until then Guess what? Have a great day and a great week and a great month. And we're coming up to the end of the year. So having a, have a great year. <laughs> so far, it's been a good year for the, for the Legacy Bible Podcast. We've, we've really grown over the last few months. And so, well, okay, let's just go on. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>